most influential man in Woodrow Wilson's administration in the world at that time. He helped form the Federal Reserve System. Uh, reason I put him up, he got his force from the Houston, Texas Central Railway out of Houston, Texas. Uh, that's what made him a rich man. So it's all about the rule of capture. Mr. East was a policeman in, in Denison, Texas, city named after George Denison, who was vice president of the Katy Railway. The railroads were given wide swaths of property. All the railroads in Texas, a lot, most of them ran back up through Denison, from birds there to go to St. Louis, Chicago, and New York, where the eastern capital was. Now, they needed the, the railroad needed a, rail, uh, a railroad locomotive repair yard, so they go up onto Mr. East's door, knock on his door in 1902, and say, Hey, how's the groundwater here? And Mr. East takes them out and gives them a drink of water in a 30 foot deep well. Well, Mr. East, we're doing a railroad repair, locomotive repair yard over here around the corner. Just want to know about the water. Thank you. High five. They left. They go over the next day and drill 60 foot deep, 20 foot wide, and put a pump down there and start pumping 25,000 gallons a day out. Dries up Mr. East and all the wells in the neighborhood. So Mr. East sues, like you do, right? There's no other source of water because they didn't have a municipal water line. Well, Mr. East loses at the trial court level. And the weird thing about it was when I looked at the records, he didn't pay a jury fee, which, why wouldn't you pay a jury fee to have your peers on the jury when against the big old Houston Railroad Company? Well, most people in town work for the railroad companies. <laughs> so he went to the judge. The judge, for whatever reason, said nobody knew what was underground, so there's no liability here. Mr. East takes it to the appeals court in Dallas, and Judge Bookout, who was from New York, said, this is wrong. You have to recognize the correlative right that people have in water. You know, you can't tell me that, take an example, the TAR stole from me in that article, you know, you got a malt here, each straw will affect how much is pulled out of that malt, right? Well, he said the same thing. In Texas, we don't recognize correlative rights, which is silly when it comes to groundwater. But nonetheless, he loses, he wins 1100 bucks at the appeals court. They go to the Supreme Court. By this time, Dillard and Head, the law firm representing the uh, the folks at uh, the railroad company, now they, they've been represented by Baker, Botts, Lovett, and Baker, or whatever it was at that time. And they wanted to take the Supreme Court level. They had to use an 1843 case in England to back them up. But they won. So the real capture is simple. This is Bill's land, Peter, Jennifer's, and Charles's. If, you, if we're gophers looking through the ground, once Jennifer gets two wells and starts pumping harder there, she'll create a coner depression where you suck up both sand and water into the well, and all this water goes to the lowest point, and we're all out of luck. And guess what? We can't do a thing about it. And we've continued to reinforce that through the years. The last one was in 1996 up in Jacksonville where a fellow named Cipriano and a fellow named Fane had a farm and Ozarker goes next door and digs a big spring facility for the spring water and dried up their wells. And the spring board said, root the capture applies. So it's there. Now, again, back to this Oxford. This is where the biggest pump has an effect. Maybe not so much here. But we're in, we, 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 no matter if groundwater dish, we still have rule capture in Texas. There are three exceptions. You can't waste the water, okay? You can't use it maliciously against your neighbor. In other words, you, you can't waste it means you've got to put it to, quote, beneficial use. But what's the definition of beneficial? Two letters, M-Y. My use is always beneficial, right? So how can that subjective, you know? You can't cause subsidence. It's the main hammer there. Uh, uh, Smith Southwest Industries sued Friendswood because Friendswood, you know, Exxon did the subdivision down south of Houston. They pumped water out, caused subsidence on Smith Industries land. So you can't cause subsidence. We're liable to find that out here in Austin, Texas soon. You know why? Because we've got private wells can be drilled in Austin. And I'm looking for the first one of these big estates that drilled a deep well that pumps out so much groundwater, the foundation breaks on the house next door. Even though they can do that without liability on the rule of capture, they can't cause subsidence. I hope it doesn't happen. All right, one next case real quick, Fort Stockton. Uh, here's where everybody's right and nobody's wrong. Clay Williams and his daddy, take me his daddy and all these guys on this land down here. Here's Fort Stockton, which is home of Comanche Springs, the most prolific springs in Texas, made Mark Springs look like nothing. The 50s drought comes along, and Clay Williams and other ranchers, in fact, one of my one of my classmates at Austin High's dad actually ranched out here too. He won't talk to me. He's so afraid to talk about it. I want to interview him so bad. <laughs> he thinks I'm going to be against him, but look, 
when they drove during these water wells, it dried up the spring, which then dried up Comanche Creek that came out of the springs and put 90 plus families that had senior appropriative rights to use the water from Comanche Springs to irrigate their land for crops. This had to be irrigated out here, okay? Well, they all went out of business. And so they sued, and it didn't even get to the Texas Supreme Court. They lost, the, the irrigators lost at the trial court and at the appeals court because of the rule of capture. And everybody out there vilifies Clay Williams' death. But I don't think that's right. If I was Clayton Williams' daddy and I owed the bank money, I had a bunch of little kids, and I had cattle to keep alive, and the drought comes, I'm going to do whatever I can to protect my family. And what it points out to me is that since we've got these odd rules in Texas, they were right by the law, but these folks were right also. And we chose this route. And they still do this. These springs are still dry. When I was out there a couple years ago doing field research, it actually hailed on me in August. It, Fort Stockton. I don't know how I'm that lucky. But I, it put me, God put me under a, uh, an old shed with some guys that worked at that park, and they asked him, does it ever, do the springs ever flow anymore? He said, every now and then when we have a real wet winter, they turn the pumps off, we'll get a trickle in the springs. Now that's a sad situation, but that's the best way I can explain to you the conjunctive relationship of water. But you can't vilify these people, and I'm sad for these people. Comanche Creek, I took it, last time I was there, I walked well over here under I-10, it just disappears because there's no more water. But again in Texas, you own the groundwater underneath your land. When it pops up in the spring, you still own the water until it enters into a, a water course. When it enters into a water course, it becomes state land. All right? And that's a big, important thing when you're out doing work in farms and ranches. All right, what does the water ignore? Political boundaries, okay? We've set up our structure in Texas around political boundaries. I'll show that in a minute. We made a decision in 1949 that we would figure out a way to manage our groundwater. Our preferred method was local <laughs> groundwater conservation districts. Local's great. We like to have local control. Tom Hatfield, my old friend that wrote the book Rudder in 1964, he was at, he was, his master's thesis for UT was about the 50's drought. And he has a great quote in there. He says, the worst drought in Beaumont history, where they get about 45 inches a year of rain, okay, rain a year, is double the rain El Paso gets in a good year. So how do we manage our water resources around a state that's got that much, much of a variance? So local <coughs> control makes sense. We don't cover all our county because some counties don't want a groundwater district. So they got no regulation whatsoever. And guess what one of those is? Southwest Travis County. Okay. And they're a problem also because since we have local control, we don't vote in enough money on the local base areas to have enough to keep their offices open. I did a study about that, and uh, it, it's kind of shocking to see how little money some of these people have for their groundwater management. This is major minor aquifers based upon a county map, okay, together, and there are areas of Texas that maybe you don't need a groundwater district because there's not much groundwater. I disagree because there are, there are no aquifers, but there are pools of water there, okay. Now, here's an overlying map of the aquifers not managed by GCD in the blue. So we've got major aquifers that aren't managed by GCD, so it's just wild rule of capture. These hatched areas are called priority groundwater management areas, which the legislature allowed the TCEQ to put in place when there's a threat of losing the groundwater, and that's what we're in here, okay? But, and once you have a pigment put in your area, then you get into a lot of disputes about is the county gonna manage your groundwater? You don't set up a GCD, who's going to manage the groundwater, and that's where we are in southwest Travis County. Now, again, look at the map. There are large areas. Washington County, where I went and ran the Lone Star Water Forum last Saturday with a bunch of lawyers. It doesn't have a groundwater district. Up here, Hamilton County doesn't have one. And you get up here around Fisher and Scurry County, these other counties, I'll go teach up there, and they say, why do we have one in Cur Cur Curry County? Because Fisher doesn't have one. They take all our groundwater. Williamson Bell County. I spoke at the at the uh, Clearwater Law Conference a couple years ago, and they're fussing. We got a groundwater district here, but Williamson doesn't, so they just take our water. So why are we even trying to manage it? So the legislature needs to decide if we're going to have a statewide policy and figure out some way. Plus, water ignores political boundaries, right? How do you set up counties over an offer that may cover several counties, which troubles me in the courts. 
Here's another example of where there are big holes here, where you know you've got districts all around you, but in, in this county, Hamilton County, there's none. They chose not to have one. So someday if I'm gonna do a I'm gonna go speak at Bosque County Heyday in two Mondays about water. If I was gonna do a golf course here, I'm gonna do it in Bosque County, but I'm gonna buy two acres here and put my water well there. I'm gonna take all the water I want to water my golf course. I don't need regulations. Now that's the, the article I wrote in the Texas Water Journal. You can get online. I'd, I'd recommend you read it. it was a, I did a study of the groundwater districts in Texas and uh, to determine how well they were financed. And that was published back in May. And we've got groundwater districts that have a total gross revenue in the year of $20,000 a year. They can't even have an office, yet they're managed all the groundwater in Brewster County. Oh, the people that voluntarily, and I got about 40 volunteers to come, I didn't want to go through the Public Information Act to force the information, so I got volunteers. And only one had more gross revenue in a year than a normal McDonald's makes, which is $2,650,000. Only three had more than the tennis shoe, tennis shoe store at Bar Creek Mall, what's that called, Finish Line makes in a year of $1,600,000 in gross revenue. So we're managing our preferred method of groundwater management is by districts, but the districts, because of our lack of a bit wanting to pay taxes, you don't have to have out on taxes for them, because of our maybe lack of wanting to pay fees, we're trying to manage it to where the folks don't have any money to do it. And maybe that's okay. But again, if you're thinking long term for Texas, if I move next to Bill out at his ranch and he puts in a deeper well and drives my well up, I got no liability with Bill. So I got to go deeper. And let me tell you something, deep water wells caught in the casing cost sixty or seventy thousand dollars. May cause people to have to move. Those are real considerations. In in Washington County the other day is one old lawyer named Bill Knight asked who I like, who's completely he'd been practicing law since nineteen fifty three. He completely didn't want a groundwater district. He said, Well just if 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 that's the case, just go drill you another well or go over there about twenty miles and go to that public water system and get it. Well that's fine, but what if you're a young couple? They've got kids in school and stuff. They're not going to bring you that water from that water plant 20 miles away without you paying for the pipeline. So, I mean, I know we're all on our own, but if we're Texans, we got to think about how we balance those things if we want to keep growing, okay? And it's a hard, hard problem to think of. All right, now this, you've seen that. Here's how we've tried to deal with political problems. It's going to get more complicated through the years. We decide we'll set up groundwater management areas. So this will put all the districts together and we'll try to manage based on the aquifers. So we decide a few years ago in the legislature that these GMAs get together and fight it out and have desired future condition of their aquifers. They have to file a report. The first one came in October 2000, September 2010. For example, GMA 2 files a report after public hearings of all their districts and all the public what they want the Ogallala to look like in 50 years. First one they filed was draw it down to zero, and the Water Development Board says, "No, we're not going to approve that." So they drew it down 50 percent, is what their model said in 50 years. Okay, it's just all guesswork. Then they came back with once the DFCs came in, the Water Board then takes a model of groundwater and comes up with managed available groundwater, but you don't have to manage to that. It's an indication of how much water might be there now based on what's being pumped plus what's exempted. Well, oil and gas is exempted and domestic livestock uses are exempted. Okay? So you can pump up to, you could potentially get 25,000 gallons a day out of your own well at your house in most areas. Nobody uses that much. But we don't know how many exempt wells are out there. So the point I'm saying is this model is not a good model. And we know that. All right? But think about that. We have the mag for the Hayes Trinity District. It was down here, Buda, that area, San Marcos. I took the, just not even a scientific study, I took the last census and I looked and see how many people have their water only from water wells in their backyard. I took that, figured they'd take about 5,000 gallons a month each. I applied that to the managed available, model available groundwater for that district and there should not be another well permit even for a house issue because it's all gone, okay? So that's a headache, but we're not looking at it right because we don't even know how many wells are out there. Most people don't even have a meter on their well. And I'll tell you, if 
if you got a ranch out there, and if you don't have it, even any well you got, go spend eight hundred dollars, get a meter on that well. Why? So you can prove when the laws change what your historic use was, because we will protect your historic use. Don't think you're going to come in front of that administrative hearing person or judge. Well, old Bill told me we got about this much water each year out. That ain't going to work. That meter will give it to you. That's why some of these big cases have been lost. All right, it gets more complicated as you start overlaying them. We manage surface and groundwater differently. And by the way, we're going to, one of the scary things for us in our areas, in, in the Austin Board, that they, when I'm on the risk reduction committee, they're worried about adding the word, is there a groundwater, are you in a groundwater district or not in our, in, in our, in our in sales disclosure notice? Well, how do you know which groundwater district you're in? So luckily, we're able to cross the maps over, and eventually our mapping soon, before we put it on the dis, on the disclosure notice, you'll be able to see an auto pop, just like where the school districts are, what groundwater district you're in, okay? That way you can at least tell your seller to disclose you're in a groundwater district. Why is that important? If you're in Barton Springs, Edward Oxford Groundwater District, which covers part of Travis County, if you've got a domestic livestock well for your house, that is exempt from permit, okay? You gotta register, but you're exempt from permit. Here comes a water line in front of your house that you get to tap into. Okay. Well, us as realtors, we're going to say, wow, we've got a water well to water the yard because you've now tapped at the street. Guess what happens to that water well in the backyard? It's now non-exempt. It needs a permit. So here's another headache people don't realize. The sad thing is we got 99 groundwater districts with 99 different sets of rules, with 99 different definitions of domestic livestock. So kind of really important and where it's going to catch us is when when the water gets gets really 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 short all right how much groundwater regulation is too much this is a letter down in del rio that their engineers put together and i got from a friend of mine on the city council there they had a big lawsuit about we don't have time to talk about it they spent millions of dollars for 12 years and came to the same result every time the city didn't get to take the rancher's water uh, but it says here the rule of capture still applies and your worry is Val Verde County, your water can go away because you, the ranchers don't want a groundwater district down there. Now, good news, desal works, got to pay for it. They say in El Paso they do 27 million gallons a day. That's a misrepresentation. They can net out about 12 million a day because 15 million gallons a day is to wash the sludgy salt out of there. Okay, but still, it'll work if you want to pay for it. Now, they built that plant two years. And they re-inject the sludgy water, the byproduct water, 22 miles away into an underground well. Now, 4,000 feet deep. Now, Porter, you just said right away is a problem. Well, the idea is to keep this thought in mind. Here's all our brackets. We got brackets reserves everywhere. That's a mock-up that I was given that shows the water goes through under pressure through this filter. It sucks up, this filter sucks up the, the salty water. It's not just salt water, it's, it's all kind of mineral salts and down in the middle of this pipe comes out fresh water, okay? Uh, that's one of the, when I took a tour of the plant, that's one of their filters, just like ours. Every gallon gets this much salt out of it. Wow. It's too toxic to do anything with. They shipped it to Vermont for the fun of it and said, would y'all use this on your roads? And Vermont shipped it back and said, no, it rust out the bottom of every car and truck in our state. <laughs> and it did, you can ship it up. But that's the problem. You can't dump that into our, bi our, our, our bays, right? works offshore because you can dump it in the Gulf, it, 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 you know, it dilutes it. You can't do that here. That's the big expense. The plant itself is so efficient, one person can run it by one computer. It's the darnest thing I've ever seen. Again, it's built two years. Now, those are the pumps that go on the pipeline to that mountain back there. They didn't have a right-of-way problem. Guess why? They were next to Fort Bliss and all that 22 miles was Fort Bliss. Had you gone through 22 miles of private ranch land, especially in a well, a more populated area, that plant would not be operational until maybe my grandkids are my age. Not that, that's probably exact, maybe 20 years. So I mean, it's a real headache. That's why I'm lobbying right now at the state, <laughs> quietly, to get the GLO and any state land to start setting aside easements for a pipeline corridor someday down the road before we, if we ever sell the land. And the way to do it is not to come buy people's land but I'm trying to convince them, and some other guys are, to ground lease that easement for 100 years. To do off-channel off, off reservoirs to catch our floodwaters, 
don't go try to buy the land from the rice farmers. Give them a hundred year ground lease and let them use the water sometime and make that way they still own the land. They get some money out. And we can store some water. Those are sensible things. Instead of you know people, some people just don't want to sell the land at all. And I don't blame them. You know, but there are ways we can do it in a different way. Fracking. These are tanks out in Ozona from one of my studies. That's a 50 acre foot tank above ground. There must be 500 of these little pipes running at all the wells that are reworking and refracking there. Okay, now the ranchers out there are getting more than 80 cents a barrel now. They're getting up to $2 a barrel for their water. So some, there are 18 of these. A year ago, there were 18 of these out there. They're no, they have no permit required. Okay, oil and gas is permit free. 50 acre feet times 325,851 gallons. That's a lot, right? Now, you can't blame the rancher. I've got one friend out there that's holding on the last 3,000 acres of a family ranch. He just wiped work in town to pay their bills. You know, it's dry as a bone out there. They don't raise crops. They don't nobody irrigates. They got cattle. Well, they're selling this water to the well, oil producer, which is great, making 10,000 bucks a month. Well, I don't blame him for that. Thank goodness he's got some money. But he said, Charles, my windmills are beginning to clamp dry. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, Slade, have you thought about what happens when you lose your ag valuation? Because you can't raise cattle unless you do wildlife, which is a lot more work. And let's just say that scenario. You have a five-year rollback that first year, do that year. And if you want to get back in the ag valuation business, you've got to go five years in the ag business. And on top of that, you're paying the IRS money as you get that money in. So you might be a big do loop there. And whereas it's great for the community, and I and I can tell you now, I was in a meeting with Christy Craddock and AM Graduate School asked me to be there and be involved in a real small meeting. Fracking is not damaging our water. Gasland one and two may work up, may be a problem in, in old Rockefeller fields. It's not here because our wells are deeper than that. If casing leaks, that's one thing, but Exxon doesn't have casing leaks. The big thing is, what if you use all your groundwater up in an area and the oil boom goes away in 20 years, what happens to the community? Because some of these aquifers don't recharge properly. And we have to think about those consequences. But you can't tell the people in Carn City, well, you shouldn't be doing fracking down there because they've had trouble just holding on to the land down there for years. And plus, goodness gracious, the oil and gas business brings one of the reasons we're growing so much. And we're going to be not dependent on foreign oil someday. Vice Presidents, that's why I'd be raging hell about it. I'd say we're not dependent on foreign oil anymore. Now, there are problems with some small oil and gas operators, but Exxon's already beginning to reuse their water. It's so expensive. And in my area, in Wilson County, there's a group out of Canada called Gas Frack that's fracking. I mean, every single person that was in that room with me were all the leaders of TCEQ, the lawyers, everybody in that one room at Christy Craddock's, and one of my dear friends, Bill Black, is her lawyer and chief counsel. Across the board, that's not the problem. It's not damaging our groundwater. It's using it up. So that's something to consider. This is on the way to Reeves, to Pecos in Reeves County. I had to go out. I was involved in a deal with the Bullock uh, from my students. It was an exhibit called Enduring Women. And I went out to introduce the students who were doing the interview to some nice old lady that we used in, in Pecos. She's 93. And they wanted me to come make the introduction. So I drove all the way to Pecos to do it. I left late one night, got to Fort Stockton, and pooped out and fell asleep. But God was with me. I got up the next morning early, drove 57 miles to Pecos. When I crossed the Reeves County line, 30 miles from Pecos, I counted 117, 117 active oil wells I could see from the road. And every one of them's fracking. This is a this is an honor system frack pit. You can pull up to this pit that's about 25 acre feet with your truck and get it. Here's the electrical supply, there's a water meter, there's a water well. Okay? And you fill out a little chit saying I use this much water, put it in a right next to the porter potty, potty, which is nice thing to do that for you. And they put it in the <laughs> in the mailbox and they bill you for it. Okay. Now, again, Pecos is a town that's about to blow away. And that's bringing them back. The question is, when they're reworking wells, is that producing new oil and gas, which doesn't have to have a permit, or is it reworking an existing production well that may need a water permit, and nobody's had the guts to face that yet? The other thing TCEQ has not faced yet is you heard me say that state water is owned by the state. So if Bill diverts the water in a creek above me from a dam, he drives me up, I can go complain to the TCEQ. I've had people come across the state to my water rights classes in different parts of the states come in and say, look at this letter from the TCEQ. 
I got 20 acres in East Texas, Charles, and a, I don't know why people don't like dentists. The dentist from Dallas bought the property above me and put in a dam, and I don't have any water for my county. And I complained to TCEQ, and you know what they wrote back? We don't get involved in neighbors' disputes. <laughs> and I asked the TCEQ about it. I said, Charles, that's our policy now because we don't have enough examiners to do this all around the state. Don't take from that. You can go do this. But yeah, it's like with Trek right now. I advise my clients sometimes, don't file a complaint with Trek because you're in a situation where if it's in a lawsuit where I'm an expert witness, you've got to build your case so well you may as well go to court with it because the Trek examiner is going to he's too busy trying to do other triage things, people stealing money through property management. He's going to come back and say, insufficient evidence. And the other side is going to wave that letter saying, hey, I got out of jail free. No, it just means you didn't build your case right. You know? So anyhow. All right. Splashdown in San Antonio. Generates a million, two to a million six of sales tax revenue every year. Open eight months a year. You take that same water to Hondo, and you're going to make that farmer an extra fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a year. So what's better for society? Okay, I don't know. I've got. A, I don't think I've got a photograph here, but my next photograph next to it is one of cornfield without irrigation. This corn's over my head. Cornfield next door to it without irrigation is this high. So they got to have the irrigation. And we've got those choices coming up. Uh, the two bit two billion dollars. There's ten percent of it guaranteed to rural rural communities. That's why the rural community is saying. We're not going to give you that money. It's all going to go to San Antonio, Dallas, and Fort Worth. So why should we vote for the $2 billion out of the rainy day fund? I say, I know you don't want to hear this, but $2 billion is nothing. And we're going to refill that fund from oil and gas revenues. But we got to do something to convince the people in New York that are going to be buying our bonds that we're implementing some water plans so in the long run they will invest in a 40-year bond, right? That's what we got to do. That's good for the state of Texas, I think. So please vote yes. All right, feds have a big problem. They're coming after us. They always will. Endangered species. San Antonio has a, a minimum amount, a max amount of water they can take out of that aquifer. It's the only source they've got. What if they have to have more flow from San Marcos and Comal Springs? That means they'll have to lower the amount of water San Antonio takes or where does San Antonio go? And that's just, there's another 120 something endangered species and much many of their aquatic that the federal government is looking into that may impact our flows and our streams. While well, the Blackwell River Authority and the TCQ were found negligent in the death of the 23 hooping cranes. So that's why I'm plenty concerned about the LCRA board recommending to TCEQ and asking them, can we please cut off flow to Matagorda Bay? I don't know if you know any board members, I don't know any current board members of LCRA, and I, that's a nice thought, but that, that horse has left the barn. We can't cut out environmental flow, okay? And I don't want to see TCEQ get involved in 10 years of lawsuits at a billion dollars because the feds are going, hey, the first, I don't know the guy that did it, smart guy, Ralph, the moment they voted, he put the paper, he said, wait a second, you're going to cut off flow to Matagorda Bay when you're still watering your grass in Austin? You know? I don't know who's right or wrong there, but we're not going to win that battle. The FCRA, Becky Motel, one of the reasons I think she resigned was the heat coming from everything. Said she's going to drop the lake level on our, our they're not constant level lakes, they're pass-through lakes. They work within a range. And everybody raised cane about that. Rightly so. You know, where they get, what, six, eight hundred dollars a boat slip next to Mozarts each month? You know, if it's three feet down, that boat's going to drop into the mud. You know, that's a bunch of money there. Carlos and Charlie's closed up, you know. But how do we balance that out? We want, how many people I know here say we can keep every drop of our water up here for us? Well, I don't understand that. But what about other people downstream? You know, all those, it's a complicated process to try to figure out. And somebody's got to get up in the legislature and try to address all this across the board. But, you know, we are in Washington County last week. The, the question I had asked, and I planned the whole thing for them, and we had 150 people there, about 200 actually. And I got all the key lawyers, we did a panel about it. And, you know, the bottom line is people said, well, you know, we just, we, we're not really sure that, that we want any kind of control here whatsoever, our groundwater. So I got to tell you, my thought was, you know, I'm not sure I want to own a piece of land in Washington County if I'm dependent on groundwater when Lake Somerville's dried up. So all that's considered. Austin private wells are a problem. We don't know what's going to do with the priority groundwater management area here in Southwest Travis County. Paul Workman wanted to do a GCD. 
I like Paul a lot, but one of the things that, that, that troubled uh, people in the legislature was he was going to exempt Bee Cave and Lakeway from any participation 